is about owning a mistake, taking the power out of something. And I'm trying to make a really conscious effort that if I mess up, that my children see me go, look, I made a mistake, I'm owning it, and now I'm gonna fix it, if it's within my ability to do so. But there's a, a real sort of power in owning that and rather than hiding from it. Mm. And it's those kinds of things, just always calibrating, always you know, recalibrating how you want to be, both as a mother, as a woman, as somebody you know, that's working in that environment with your colleagues, just always recalibrating how you see yourself, not just saying, this is it, now this is who I am. Dr. Class. Do you know what? Uh, not many people call me Dr. Class, <laughs> so it's nice to hear it. It's going to go on all my uh, Christmas cards this year. <laughs> well, you've got lots of hats, lots of names and lots of achievements. And in fact, this is, I'm paying homage to one I of them. I do part your t-shirt. I have seen is, it before at the party. This is your t-shirt now. This is the Mylene t-shirt. Thank you very much. You Patricia. are now a legend. Again, only with you. <laughs> <laughs> In my household, it's very humbling because I'm just mum. <laughs> no, you are a legend. Um, so thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm starting out this new venture, this podcast, um, and I, I'm, you know, trying to flip the script a bit on different types of topics, um, sustainability, how we look at that word, um, and that fits into so many other things um, to do with people and the world we live in. Um, I actually, I mean, I've done a lot of research um, on this kind of thing and on you, but what I'm going to do now, I think, is it, it's kind of like a, one of those movies, you know, when they have a speech ready and they kind of, then they just go like, do you know what? They fold it up and then they just say something from the heart. So I'm going to start... Going off script. I'm going to off, go off way. script. I'm going to kind of start this off by just being real, really, and just really vulnerable. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is this is so huge for me. Um, and I'm stressed. <laughs> no, you're not. Do you, you, you know what? I've seen you in action, Petra. You do so much. I, I think I hide it well, right. definitely. But... Yeah, I think that's just the best way to be. I just think I want this podcast to be real. Um, so on that, how do you, you do so much? How do you cope with stress? And do you get to that point where you just, you reach a peak or do you manage it? No, I feel overwhelmed a lot. And I think it's probably a combination of coffee and not very much sleep and when people say well you should get some more sleep I just don't know where I'd find the hours I'm, I'm a working mom and usually things derail when um your kids are ill so that you know things that things are completely out of your control or they're just changes that are unforeseeable and and you just you find a way to roll with of things that's for sure I have got better at um just not sweating the small stuff I really don't sweat the small stuff, but I'm human. As I say to my children, mm. I'm human. I think it's an important thing to remember because I think your kids often need you to be superhuman and, and, and want you to be, but I think it's more helpful for them in the long run just to realise that everybody is human and people get overwhelmed and to show that and then to, to show how you cope with it. So I'm always aware that there are little eyes watching me all the time and learning from what I do and don't do, which I suppose in its own way could you know, you put the pressure on you to try and do the right thing all the time. But I think, um, what is the right thing? You know, I'm trying at the minute trying to guide my, my children through a technological world, but mm -hmm. we weren't taught how to do it because it didn't exist. So there's all the things that come up that you just don't know the answers to. Yeah, you have to take them day by day. I guess you have to be in the moment, which is probably the purpose of life, but just so, super hard for any human to do, just to be really all in that moment and... Because when you're in that moment, the past, the future, it's not that it doesn't matter, but it's just not there. It doesn't exist. So you just have that moment and that's it. And we should just be living within that kind of that space. But that's the hardest thing to do. Ideally. And I think it's that lesson, isn't it? It's um, not rushing to the destination. It's yeah. that cliche all the time about enjoying the journey. But I think one of the biggest lessons for me is when Ava was really little and we were we were on our way on holiday and she was so excited by the travelator 
the travelator where the luggage was just going around, which is probably one of the most stressful environments for the parents <laughs> where you're, you're, you're trying to make sure they don't catch their fingers as the suitcases are coming off. They want to get involved. The kids want to get involved and, and pull the suitcases off the travelator as the as the luggage goes round and round. You just want to get to, to you know, start your holiday. And you just realise, actually, to them, this is the holiday. This is all part of it. There are the bags going round of different colours and people are picking their bags up and, and running off with them. And it's just brilliant. And that was just a real moment where I just turned around and just thought, just don't rush through everything. Yeah. Because what I think is, you know, just, just something that you've got to get through and get to the next part of, of, of whatever your day looks like. To them, that could be the most exciting part of the day bags yeah going round and round <laughs> well kids they are like when they say are we there yet it's because they are literally living in the moment so yeah, they're yeah. just waiting and they've got the promise of whatever is to come exactly whatever treats or anything else but yeah quite right <laughs> actually going off of that then just going back to kind of the beginning and you know just share whatever you're comfortable with but what was younger, like little Mylene, like? Because that's not, I mean, I've known you for a while now. And just to give the listeners um, context, like we've worked together and I've known you and got to know you. Um, but I've never kind of seen or heard about that side of things. That's an understatement already because you say we work together, but actually you go above and beyond, Patrick. You go above and beyond for my family because we, I, I don't know if people know what you're really like, but you're the most thoughtful person ever. You know, do you, you've, you just see people and, and it's so lovely. The fact that you've travelled with your mum to come and watch my daughter play in her <laughs> piano concert, I'll never forget that. So I'll literally do anything for you because but we, we love you give those, time. We love those, like you said, the small things, they do count. And well, that was quite a pilgrimage, so it was we, a long way. <laughs> Thank you, it wasn't quite a small thing. We love those things and like, it is the thought that counts and that's so cliche, yeah. but that's what me and my my family, we kind of live by, I guess. And yeah, we, I, we, we cherish the people that are, you know, important to us so. yeah no very much so that's the Italian in you now yeah. <laughs> for sure but no um younger Marlene I was um very very shy I have a school report that actually said if Marlene's name wasn't on the register we wouldn't know she was in the class I was like that it's funny isn't it and I look back at that time and I can't even imagine but, um that being my school report but uh if you're a mixed race girl growing up in Norfolk, not really knowing where you fit in, it's a it's a really challenging time, and that was most definitely me until I found my tribe. And I think when you find your tribe, and there were a group of musicians from from London, and it was just something that really opened up the world to me. I, I did find that it was um, quite a difficult place to be in to to be a, a girl that was into astronomy. You know, I formed the Planets Club and nobody joined um, <laughs> t- to be a classical musician where, again, it, it was like social suicide walking down the street with a violin on your back <laughs> in Norfolk in the uh, in the 90s. I was into that kind of stuff too. I, f- I feel like you're a certain type of person when you're into that kind of thing. I remember my dad buying me women in astronomy. Like Where did bit. you get yeah. women in astronomy? Yeah. As opposed to just astronomy. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, just women in astronomy. It was a separate book. <laughs> well, I was woman in astronomy. Nobody <laughs> joined my club. So, you know, at the time, they hadn't even... Uh, Pluto was still the planet, so uh, oh, yeah. I had a, a few more space to, to bases to fill. Oh, that fascinates me. No, but it sounds like we were quite similar in that sense. I was really quiet. Um, I mean, I still am... But I'm, I've got more of a sense of confidence now, whereas I was quite shy. But I think a lot of people used to, like, they mistook me being quiet as not confident. And that's still carrying through to, to today because I'm Do not you know, I would agree with person. you because I think the way that you carry yourself, there is a quiet confidence about you. But I, I remember we went to go and see Snoop Dogg and something was going wrong with the tickets and you this were right. different front, story. <laughs> you were front and centre just sorting out the whole thing. <laughs> Petra... The smallest in our group, not to be <laughs> underestimated, at a Snoop Dogg concert, pushing right to the front and sorting the whole thing out. Well, that's the Italian mother coming through. I have to mention Donatella, everybody. Donatella came through. She does, because when I have to talk about her, because she has definitely given me that kind of spark, I guess. And she, I remember t- she used to tell me stories of like back in the 80s, there was like this, um, you know, they had that punk kind of era. There was like a she used to say punk, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, he, was, sure. he was on the phone and he was kind of just um, like hogging the phone, you know, when there was just the pay phones and you had to queue to like use it. This really tall, big guy with like big leather jacket and my mum, this like five foot two lady, Italian lady, just 
screaming at him to like get off the phone and like kind of like and he was scared and it, yeah i bet your mum i wouldn't mess with donatella <laughs> <laughs> she's so lovely but yes so, don't mess with mama yeah so it yeah it comes through definitely um what qualities then do you think that you you got from from your family so my mum uh is well she's retired now but she was a, an nhs nurse and my dad was in the navy so when you've got an NHS nurse and a Navy dad, a a forces, services dad. It's such a combination because you just learn to be super practical. I'm very much like my dad in the way that I'm very pragmatic. So um, I like to problem solve and I don't like to feel (laughs) helpless like anybody. No one likes to feel helpless, but I think I, I make a real point of being able to figure out how to not feel that way. I mean, I'm probably a therapist's dream, but I, it <laughs> definitely is something that, you know, my arm would have to be actually have fallen off to have had the day off school because your mum just can just know that you're okay. Yeah, yeah, you're a carer and you're logical as well. So those two very, things Very, very logical thinker. Yeah. But um, and I'm, sure, I'm sure it can be hyper annoying, <laughs> but I just like to get things done. Um, and very efficient, I suppose. But again, that's from having... That, that kind of background yeah my dad was away a lot at sea and so you've become very independent so I, I learned how to to light the pilot light in the boiler and how to change the oil in the car and how to carve the turkey at Christmas all these things I learned how to do from a very young age to be able to help my mom yeah when um, my dad was away I can see that that's definitely you that's the essence of you because I mean knowing you now and people that know you will know this too um you just you have a solution for everything and that kind of ties in with your book as well they don't yeah. teach this at school um which i have right here ah, in it's orange glory do you know <laughs> I, I, do you know that my, my sister rang me up she's in australia and she, she rang me up and she said i've just read the book and she said it's like a love letter to our childhood and no one's described it that way because everyone else describes it as life hacks or a manual that every, everyone should have because it is it's full of cpr um basic first aid basic finance plumbing all the things that you need and you don't get the chance to be taught at school and I think you know we 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 taught Pythagoras and we were taught the cells of a plant but we weren't taught things that we're using every single day and it is a frustration of mine um I understand that the curriculum is already oversubscribed and 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 difficult and teachers you know I've had teachers actually buy it and say that they've been using it which is so lovely that's the ultimate accolade um but ultimately I'd never thought of it as a love letter to my childhood and I, only my sister, I guess, or my brother would be able to to know that. So all those things that I tried to be useful around the house with, they're just in there. And it was interesting because we were in Ibiza on holiday recently and the, uh, the there was a blackout and um, we were with a family and, and of, um, friends of our family and... Um, Ava just went down, found the fuse box and sorted the whole thing out before I could even say, does anyone know where the fuse box is? And I thought, God, she's only 15. She's gone and done that. And That's amazing. Things like that that you yeah. just think, it's working. Yeah. How did it come about? How did you decide I'm going to do this in a book? It came about in lockdown when everyone was trying to Google how to do everything around yeah. the house because you couldn't get a plumber, you couldn't get a haircut, you couldn't get anything done. And I think a lot of people did feel really isolated and really helpless and I did have friends ringing me up saying, you know, I just need to change the washer on this mm-hmm. tap. or what do I, and, and all these just small things. I just thought I can help them with yeah. this. And, you know, those conversations you just have with your mates going, God, I wish they taught this at school. And I just thought, this is it. This is what I need to write. I need to put just a compilation of all the things that I wish that I had been taught or that my 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 children should know. The dedication is to them saying that, you know, so you'll always be okay. I can't guarantee that, that they will always be okay, but they'll have a better chance of not feeling so helpless with, with this in their back pocket. Yeah. And I see them using it all the time already. Well, it's nice to know that there's also like a, an emotional and personal side to it. As hugely, well. yeah. hugely. Um, I think a lot of um, families, um, especially more so than ever now, we know that it's now over one in two figure out those statistics that get divorced um there are a lot of blended families it's the gross biggest growing um uh, uh, family unit and you know we have a blended family ourselves and so life does throw a lot of curveballs and we're from the first generation now that is actually looking at, at peeling that all back and understanding what do i need what tools do i need to be able to navigate 
this new family unit or all these things that we're suddenly expected to do because everything's tech and all the answers are there, but are they the correct answers? Mm. And what do you do with the practical considerations now? Nobody wants to feel helpless. I've got silver splitters. You know, their children grow up, they go to college and suddenly you've got silver splitters going. I, I don't want, we don't want to be together anymore. And, and you've got, I had a woman who got in touch and she said, I couldn't find the fuse box. Mm. It was just a job that he'd always done. You've got kids leaving for school who don't know what the laundry labels mean. Yeah, it's, it's it's a subject on on kind of on roles as well. Like, I, I mean, I my mum was a single mum for a while. And well, I've so, been there. Yeah, it's, and I remember having to leveler. hang things up and do things like that. Yeah. But um, but we'd have help too. But it's kind of figuring out roles. And I think, like you said, we're just in a different era now, a different time. And it's hard. It's a hard one for me, really. I mean, it's hard to articulate, but it's also hard to kind of get my head round in the sense that that should there be these gender roles and actually I think you know it, I don't think it comes down to gender my dad didn't raise me um you know and like I said him, him being a, firstly an engineer in the navy and then a diver and later a captain so he took many roles within the services mm. but what was interesting within them is he taught me how to do those things the, even just the alphanumeric alphabet when I hear people ordering a pizza and I hear s for sugar for f for freddy and it's just never ever, ever clear it's like the alphanumeric alphabet my kids have learned <laughs> that before they learn the actual alphabet <laughs> It's things that are just helpful every single day. Yeah. Um, it, this book saved lives. So there's people teachers who've actually choked. use it in school. Teachers are, are using it. Yeah, That's I've had amazing. teachers who've got in touch, and it's been brilliant. It's it's I've I've got partners within the book like St John Ambulance and Save the Children who've all looked over uh, and, and and mechanics and um, um, the London Fire Brigade have all looked over all of the the, the intricate parts of the book that need genuine um, 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 like a fact check if you like. Yeah. And it's just brilliant to have people like that who are actually out there saving lives give it the seal of approval. This book has saved lives. That's amazing. There's a, a, I've included in the second edition, I've included the letter from the man who saved his wife choking and knew what to do because he's seen the videos and read the book. Yeah, And, I and another mum who made this heartbreaking video. On social media, I remember seeing that. Oh, God, it was horrific just to relive that time yeah. with her, but amazing that she felt she could share it. And she had again, learnt how to save her child from choking from the videos I'd made with my daughters and what I'd put in the book. What an amazing statistic. Look, if the book does nothing else, it's saved lives yeah. already. Yeah. Already. Yeah. I mean, and this is cliche too, but if this podcast helps just one person, I'm happy sure. with that. I, I just think, it's, it's like Ava said to me the other day, she knows what to do in certain circumstances, but what if it's her that it happens to? Will everyone else around her know? And that's where... It is going that's to take so true. a community. If I said to you now, you know, if somebody started choking right now, which is one of the most popular, sorry, mm. not even the word isn't popular. <laughs> if somebody started choking right now, it's one of the most common causes of, of you know, fatalities. Would you know what to do? Mm. And there's not many people who would. So it's something that we, I genuinely do think we should be taught at school. Yeah, I mean, that's a testament to her to even think that way. You know, yes. she's thought that way. Yeah, So absolutely. that's amazing. Yeah. But yeah, with school as well, like I, I've always thought this actually. I even thought this when I was younger and at school, you know, we should be, I, I mean, I guess it's, it's a lot of politics involved and it's very fixed, but we should be learning different things, alternative things. Not, we should not be learning to mention, basic finance, mortgages, not, yeah. how, what the, what, how, how to deal with taxes. Yeah. That's something I will yeah, forever believe in we should know but basic first aid how to look after each other and ourselves um i've recently been working with saint john ambulance um but i've covered this with my own children a lot drinks biking you know what to do if somebody needs help things that are just actual again here i go back to being pragmatic yeah. but <laughs> practical considerations Those, that's something i've actually been hearing a lot lately yeah, which all is these so things. scary like we saw a granddad who tripped over his own bag um as he was wheeling it across the road and my daughters and i we pulled the car over and we helped him and i remember um, i remember there was a hero she ran into um on like the coffee houses and she was um looking for something to try and um, stem the blood flow and the woman gave her all these tissues and she said no 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 it has to be a tea towel <laughs> I just She's thought amazing. brilliant <laughs> and gosh at the time she must have been about I don't know eight eight brilliant and I, you just think it's just little things like that but they make a huge difference yeah and I think we underestimate kids because yes. we don't um you know when they're even like babies to 
they're like, oh, they won't understand. Like, let's just wait and then explain. And you're like, no, I think if you start, I mean, I don't have kids yet, so I can't speak. But if you start early, then they will begin to develop that kind of thinking. There's a saying, give me the child till seven, I'll give you the man. I think there's a lot to be said about that. Yeah. They know right from wrong by that point. They've kind of got a clue as to who they want to be or who they are. Yeah, definitely. And I think also in schools, they should, they should, um, address like mental health and more, not spirituality, but more awareness and just of, of self and mental health. I think as well. they are in places, but I might be far removed because obviously I don't have children. Well, so I've got. Uh, uh, she's just turned sixteen, <laughs> um, so sixteen, twelve, and, and four. So I'm right across all the different yeah. uh, age groups and and even the new ways of learning now. So it is really, really interesting. It's slowly coming in, but yeah, it's not where it needs to be yet. Yeah, yeah. I think there's um there's a school that I um actually heard about in America called Muse Global and it's like a sustainability led school so it's like they they have a one plant based meal a day they grow their own food they have it's all solar paneled and they they um even learn about like water wastage and all that kind of stuff and that's the amazing direction that I think schools should not only just do that obviously with a with an original curriculum but should focus on too because I think we're going that way the world is going that way I think it's really interesting what's going on at the moment because I think there has to be really clear information given to all of us um at the moment we we see alternatives to if you're a vegetarian for example if you don't want to wear leather that there are alternatives in that in the world of fashion but what those alternatives look like can actually be quite deceptive what does the word recycling actually mean when it comes to your garments is it just a piece of the thread Mm -hmm. within the garment that's been recycled and therefore you can put a stamp on it what does you know vegetarian clothing actually look like because actually instead of one product you might be replacing it with a plastic product and you could then say that, that there are now you know different items that are being different kind of glues that are being developed also which is true but there if there's one tiny you know other new component it, that is a plastic it's almost shifting a, a problem to a different direction yeah and I think a lot of people just aren't necessarily as aware or as educated to what is what for example is going on with the labeling of their garments and what that actually means yeah it, and working in fashion gives you again a huge awareness of it just how much water does it take to produce items just how much does it take to recycle something? And is it, as you say, genuinely recycled? How much plastic is in this product? Am I saving the world on one side and taking away from the other mm-hmm. side? Well, that's the the pragmatic thinking that needs to be done to not solve it. Because, I mean, I've been learning about it quite a lot and it, it's a system. It's not, you know, you can you go to a shop and you see a sustainable toothbrush, for example, is it really sustainable? It's probably been made in one country, packaged in another country, and then shipped to another country. That We can't call that a sustainable toothbrush just because it might have been made from bamboo. Or Gosh, something. I heard of one factory at the moment who is using, who are using uh, bottles. Uh, their products are recycled from bottles, but they've got another factory making the bottles to recycle the products from. Yeah. It, it, it's just it's, so, it's overwhelming. It's the nuances. And yeah, it's the small things, and you do have to think that way. And it's we looking at that word sustainability. I think just having, I think, more transparency. Yeah, as yeah. to what it is Being you're selling real. and how and, and how and how it genuinely does affect the world that you want to be living in, because you. I, I think we can often be missold something. Definitely, it's all linked together for sure. Yeah, it's something I'm definitely going to explore more within this podcast and um, I'm going to hopefully uncover a lot of things and kind of demystify a lot of the stuff around around that topic as well. Um, But on that, I mean, sustainability covers so many things like economics, social, it covers people. So it covers, um, you know, human rights. And one thing actually that I've been talking to with my friends a lot is is your life sustainable as well? Like not, I'm not talking about things now. I'm talking about is your mental health sustainable? Is your well-being sustainable too? How um how do you kind of 
manage that day to day in terms of well-being I mean you've been through so many things you're you're also campaigning which we can go on to in a bit as well um but in terms of like keeping that you know your your well-being sustainable how how do you do that day to day um again I, I think it's something that I should learn to manage better I'm sure uh, I, I, I can get overwhelmed very, very easily. And I think that could be just down to being a tired mum or, or so many people needing me in so many different facets of work. Mm. I love what I do. I'm really proud of the work that I do. And I'm obviously utterly obsessed with my family. So it is about learning how to put yourself in a healthy position within that with so many people needing you. But um, I do have a lot of satisfaction. I get a lot of satisfaction from the work that I do, I love what I do. And that is, I suppose, something that gives me... It gives you purpose. It gives me a lot of happiness, it really does. Yeah. And on the whole, I have learned, but that's maybe it's just because I'm getting older, maybe because when you have kids, it isn't about you. you just got, you know, different priorities now, just, just to let things go. I think that's a massive... A, a massive tip if you were to ever look for one just just to decide what really actually is important yeah. what's important right now yeah will it matter in five years mm-hmm. time will it matter in a week's time yeah yeah a lot of well, a few of my friends have kids now and they do say when that happens everything just pales in comparison to having a child and just yeah, yeah and that is the most important thing and yeah that's what I've got from them as well definitely so on the campaigning then, so I just want to touch on you campaigning with Tommies. I think that's a really important thing to discuss and talk about because that's happened quite recently um, with the miscarriage law going through. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So um, uh, li- this is something that's happened in the past week or so. The um, previous to um, the changes that we've managed to implement, if I told you uh, that if you suffer a miscarriage, the way that the law worked, the way that uh, the medical world worked, was you would have to wait to have two further consecutive miscarriages. Mm-hmm. Now, if you had a, a live birth in the middle of that, you'd have to, it's almost like pressing reset, you'd have to then experience three consecutive miscarriages again. It's barbaric, it's actually torturous, and this was something that was considered, well... I want to say logical, it, there's no reason that the number three even exists. I was speaking to one of the professors uh, at Tommy's about this, and he just said, well, in America, the number is two. Here in the UK, it's three. And it's got no logical or medical reasoning behind it, which just shows you how deep-rooted women's health is uh, and the decisions are um, in Westminster. And I thought, well, you know, when I'd experienced my own miscarriages, which were just utterly heartbreaking and horrendous, I never imagined I would become a campaigner for change because I didn't know that this this nightmare, this, mm. this world existed. But once you've been a part of it and once you've experienced it, there's no way that I would want my children to experience anything close to this. Miscarriages do happen. Terrible things happen. But there must be a support system in place. And what has now happened as a result of our campaigning for four years, and that's myself and Tommy's and Olivia Blake, who is a, one of the good MPs. <laughs> it's been incredible. We've actually managed to push through actual change where no woman will have to hear those words ever again. You have to wait for two more miscarriages. You'll get medical help immediately. You get 24-7 health care, either in the form of uh, mental health support. Yeah or being uh, directed to an EPU, which is an early pregnancy unit, um, all the way through to uh, access to uh, whatever kind of medica- medication can help to support your next existing pregnancy. There's, it's just actual physical change. It's amazing that there's actual change, you know, like... I know, it's one of those things, but it, actually, it happened. <laughs> I was away at the time and, and the good news came through. I say the good news, I mean, it's... It's better news. Yeah. It's news mm. that will make a huge difference to yeah. so many families uh, that we couldn't we couldn't quite believe it. It's almost like you, you ask for something so much, you just it almost becomes a habit for just asking for it. Not actually when somebody turns around and says yes. If, if it, there was a moment of just freezing, like, are you sure? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I know it's been a long time coming. Obviously, you've done a lot of work 
um, to kind of get to this part. Um, you've got your documentary, Miscarriage and Me, um, and other kind of, yeah, things that you've been doing. So it's been a long time it's coming. It's been a very, very yeah. long time. A lot of heartache. Myself and my manager who, who pushed for the miscarriage documentary, we had nine miscarriages between us. And a lot of the women that I've worked with, their stories are so heartbreaking. But I think one person that opens the door or give, or give space for somebody to speak and, and, and everyone else then finds their courage. Because before, I couldn't do it. It took me so long to film the miscarriage documentary, I couldn't speak about it. Mm. It was just too raw. And I'm not comfortable with being vulnerable because why would anybody? But I realised that you can't tell a story that is so that is honest and that people will be able to understand unless you just tell the truth, tell it how it actually is. And and look, it was nominated for a BAFTA and we've actually created change and, and as a result, my children will never hear those words. Yeah. So it's staggering that through that immense amount of pain, we have actually created we've turned pain into power we've created something that's going to be an ever, everlasting legacy now that happens a lot in life i think when you you know you have to suffer but then you some people don't but a lot of people turn that suffering into good um and that's the whole point of life isn't it and unfortunately yeah these bad things happen and you you go through pain suffering but if you can actually use that as fuel for change. And oh, I have so much people. fuel. I'm so mad. But so, so much angry. fuel. <laughs> so angry because I felt that I was being let down. I felt that I can't have my children go through this. And then my girlfriends were telling me of their stories and those were equally awful. And everyone just had an awful experience, an awful story to yeah. tell, which was then further exacerbated by healthcare or lack of healthcare or the way that we were treated. And if I said to you, wait until you've had two more heart attacks and then we'll look at your heart attacks. Yeah, you would bizarre. just think I was the problem and you would be right to think so mm. but it seems okay that anyone can tell you to go away and have two more traumatic experiences and two more losses of life before, yeah. before someone will hear you yeah yeah it's I, I hope we will look back at this time and just it will it will be as ridiculous as as the words we're saying out loud now now you know my, my children your children will look back and, and and say gosh do you remember that time how ludicrous yeah it seems um like and I don't want to always say, oh, you know, I don't want to bring up it's a man's world type scenario, but it just but, but seems But I know, I spent a, a lot of time in Parliament like, and it, it very much... Did it feel that way? Well, no woman made that law, put it mm. that way. And it is phenomenal to have um, allies. We need allies. And so the men folk had to speak yeah. up as well in order to, to bring this to some kind of fruition. But ultimately, these laws were not made by women. The, women, the, the laws that were made are for women. Yeah. And... There is something very powerful about walking into Parliament. I, I, I went with Olivia and she showed me around. I've been there a lot recently. And there's, there's a cupboard um, where you can see where one of the suffragettes actually hid in order to be able to be present to have her vote counted. And you realised that the walls that you are, the presence that you're, you're there, you're, you, are, you are surrounded, steeped in history of women fighting the entire time for their voices to be heard. And it's a very powerful powerful feeling actually both yeah. for standing in this cupboard where a suffragette hid so that her, vo her voice would be heard and her vote would be counted so it I, empowers you I can only imagine how many scenarios like that yeah. actually happened yeah no it's quite mighty and the irony that I, mean, I never even considered that the the votes or the the decisions over my body are made in Westminster and never it, maybe very naively just never occurred to me mm. I think I think we are shifting in awareness now. I do think there is a way to go. And sometimes I feel like we take steps back, but I do see a lot of progression. I know there's more talk around, you know, um, kind of hormones as well, women's versus men's. Like, for instance, um, how we, this might be a bit too technical, too much info, but we work on like a monthly cycle men more so on a daily cycle in terms of they get testosterone every 15 minutes but we just work on this monthly cycle and I think for so long I've been thinking oh why do I why do why am I in such a mood now why this week or what and I just have to realize that this is the you know I'm in this monthly cycle and some, what can work for some people doesn't work for others and you know I know it's all kind of um 
more fluid these days and I'm all for that. And so, yeah, I'm just thinking like a day in the life of a woman is so different. And if I'm working nine to five um, in an office, that's just, that's been, that was a man's rule in a way. And I just think it's, it's, yeah, it needs to, it needs to be looked at. And I'm, I think people are looking at it because you were quite right, nine to five was the old way of working and, and the guy could go home and have his dinner ready. Whereas we're now expected as women to work the nine to five and also then go home and have everyone's dinner ready, and, and, and including our own, is is not working and, and that's rightly being challenged. But, you know, you talk about hormones. I, I took testosterone in my last pregnancy. I took every hormone going. I was on everything, for, you know, progesterone. That saves eight and a half thousand babies a year, we've discovered, which is something that women can have access to or should have access mm-hmm. to. And just, I remember the first time they gave me the testosterone cream and they, it was all whisper, whisper, because this is something, you know, the guys won't want to know that, you ten, to know that you're taking. Mm. But I, I didn't understand why it was such a big secret. Mm. But that, the fact that it's delivered in, in that sort of, in that way, in that manner, just shows you how steeped in shame women's health and women's problems are. And that's why it is important we keep talking about it and normalising it in our household. I mean, I'm sure I drive my kids mad with it, but I was just talk about every subject from you know noon from morning till noon because tonight because I just think it's it's so important. I think secrets can be so damning for anybody. Yeah, yeah I think being open and normalizing is the word. I think normalizing for sure. it for sure. Um, celebrating, celebrating, celebrating the bodies you've got. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think <clears> that sometimes when you're even you know when you're talking about your period or something and you just you feel like you want to whisper. Like, you know, around people and why, why should that's something that is, a, you know, reality that happens to us and, you know, we just need to normalize things. And, you know, lots of my friends, um, or a few of my friends have been through miscarriage of lost babies and, and also just normalizing, talking about that and just saying, look, how are you today? Because clearly from the documentary that you did and from what I've heard you say, it never leaves you. It doesn't, it's a, it's a trauma and, and trauma, whatever that might be, it stays with you in some way. Yes, it changes you um, and it makes you grow, but it, it stays with you, I think, forever. It does. And it's, it's almost that weird connection to your child. Um, and I think the four that I had, the four miscarriages that I had, and yeah, until you've experienced it, you, understanding that nightmare it is grief mm. but also you it's important that other people know how to deal with your grief if, uh, something i put up just on my insta was just questions not to ask or things not to say mm. don't say it was god's will or they're in a better place what better places with than with their mother uh it was just cells well i saw a baby on the screen you you know if you showed a child a picture of what i saw on the screen they would not say that just looks like cells they would mm. say there's a baby so there's just a way of, I think, also showing people or, or guiding people because maybe I've, I, you know, I have to think about how I, I must have been previous to my own miscarriages. Did I put my foot in it with people? It make, really makes you think. It's hard because there is, you know, if you're not conscious of it, no, um, then it's difficult. Well, I put that in the but, book. I put it in yeah, the book. Exactly. Questions to ask. Yeah. Things to say, things to do, things not to do go bring food around and, that, and I think in every culture that's something that works for when people are grieving and just can't look after themselves yeah you want to help and actually a practical consideration is just feed them or feed their family feed the people around them <laughs> feed them with food but with love yeah and just yeah. listen I think listening um I mean this is not I'm not comparing but you know when I had a breakup once it was quite hard um I wouldn't maybe go as far as traumatic but you know things like that can be it can it can change you and it it was good it gave me a shift in consciousness for sure um and it actually it propelled that it accelerated um that for me which i which was good but definitely when you're around people you know friends and family and they say things or they might trigger you know you they might say certain things and you just you think oh maybe i did do that as well maybe i kind of put my foot in it too but there should be ways of yeah just teaching people what well, I've got to this say. thing in my household with my girls, you know, the baby, I'm saying the baby, he's four years old now, but he's uh, he's going to learn from them. But it's about owning your mistake, taking the power out of something. And 
I'm trying to make a really conscious effort that if I mess up, that my children see me go, look, I made a mistake, I'm owning it, and now I'm going to fix it, if it's within my ability to do so. But there's a, a real sort of power in own, earning, owning that and rather than hiding from it. Mm. And it's those kinds of things, just always calibrating, always you know, recalibrating how you want to be both as a mother as a woman as somebody you know that's working in you know, that environment with your colleagues just always recalibrating how you see yourself not just saying this is it now this is who I am and this is how I'm going to be well we're ever changing aren't we and yeah, I exactly. think it, it comes down to again that point of being present in the moment because when you are I think then you can you you come everything you do and everything you say comes from that place and that's the pure that's the pure you really um, I mean, I always use the term ego when it comes to like the other you, the you that might be a bit more unconscious. Um, but the pure place that's within all of us, if we just tap into that more, then definitely whatever we say and do, the actions we do and the things we say are always going to be beneficial to other people and ourselves as well. I think it's interesting too. Um, we've, got, we've got this thing in the in my household about labelling your emotions. Mm. <laughs> Because, again, it's something we take for granted. You think about how you raised yourself. And no one ever labelled my emotions. And I think it's really important to be able to recognise what it is you're feeling and when. So when there's been toddler tantrums, I'll turn around and say, you're, what you're feeling right now, that's frustration. That's frustration. I know you want to go to the park. It's raining. I know you want to go and get an ice cream. It's closed. And you're trying to reason with a child. That, you know, it's not their fault. Like, they just don't have those reasoning tools. You know, Many adults don't. But just to label it, and they can actually then start using their words to be able to communicate just how they're feeling and understanding it. I'm, I'm from the generation of finish what's on your plate. And I never really learned to understand what my body did and didn't need. I never knew when I was full because I was always told when I was full. I do that now. I know. I still look at my plate and finish my plate and it bothers me. Yes. It bothers me because in my head, they say that your mum and dad are like, they're you know, (laughs) like Jiminy Crickets, aren't they? (laughs) And I'm like, oh, I don't don't need to finish that. I don't need to eat that. And the guilt applying to it then. Then you apply guilt like, oh, I shouldn't have just one more cake or treat or whatever else. Or you think, oh, other people don't have this. Well, I don't want my kids to have it. So I just say, you know, what did your body say? (laughs) Did your body say you're full? Okay. Oh, I'm terrible at tapping into what my body wants. Yeah. Well, I'm still same. not good at labelling what emotions I'm feeling. Same. Same. I'm still not good at that. And I'm something I'm definitely trying to work on, actually. But, yeah, yeah how? <laughs> well, I don't know. This is the tricky bit I've got. <laughs> like I said, it's with my own children. I'm really trying just to make sure that I can be the adult that... If they say you try to be the adult that you would have needed as a child. And just absolutely no um, disdain or anything. It's not. It's like you know your parents do the best that they can, and you you then either take that lesson and you take the good bits that you really agreed with, and you maybe work on the bits that you think, well, this could have helped me if it had been handled in this way. Who knows? And also, your children aren't mini yous. They're they're new people that you have to get to learn. Yeah. You know, I've got three children who are so different, really, really different little people. And why wouldn't they be? Because they are their own people. And I think it's actually fun getting to learn them. It's very difficult as well to learn to say goodbye to versions of them as they get older. But just labelling, this is why you're feeling this frustration. This is what you can do about it. And showing them a coping mechanism for things. I think that actually is quite helpful. Again, it's something I wrote about in the book. It's something about just saying, you know, dealing with friendships, dealing with FOMO, dealing with situations that are not so obvious. You You can't just park it or let it go or don't look at your phone and the problem will go away it's about actually saying right this is how I'm feeling recognizing how you're feeling and then deciding what you're going to do with that yeah definitely yeah it's super interesting actually just on that point with with kids um do you think that they 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 are born with that with a personality then or are they because when you kind of you know you think people are kind of conditioned over a period of time but I've noticed with some of my friends kids who I'm very close to they're just they're they're born with with that already, and I'm just thinking, what well, where did they where did they I get think that environment from? Has a huge part to yeah. play within it, and and the and influence peers. of parents and friends. Peers are huge. Mm. Your friendship group. Do you remember when your mum and dad knew nothing, and your friends knew everything? It's, it's kind yes. of just that feeling. Yeah. Like, I really tried to, to put myself back in that you know part of my life when 
you used to think that way because it's a really powerful set mm. of emotions. It starts at nursery as well. Yeah, probably, of course with, yeah. it does. And yeah. embarrassment and wanting to fit <laughs> in. And actually it still, you know, runs now into yeah. to adulthood. So um, what's next for you? Because obviously you've achieved so much throughout, not only, you know, throughout your life. What's What's coming up next that we can chat about that's important for you? Do you know, I'm really just proud of of where I am at the moment in my life with what I'm doing because I feel that rather than trying to find my place now, I feel like I've established what I do mm-hmm. and, and I make no apology for it. For it was it wasn't cool to like classical music. But you know, I've worked for a, a, class, a classical radio station. It is now. For 18 years. <laughs> 18 years. Yeah. And people are now really coming to classical music <laughs> through Film music, cinema, yeah. Hans Zimmer and John Williams and all of these incredible composers, cinematic com- composers. Um, I have my own clothing line. I work as an ambassador for brands. I I write my books and, and I, I, I love being a campaigner and, and using my voice to, to actually affect change. Mm-hmm. And all those things, it's really nice to be able to write my own script because a lot of people would love for you to stay in your own lane. You're a musician, so you can't be a broadcaster. If you're a broadcaster, you can't be an author. And it's really fun just to go, well, actually, why not? Just try new there things There is no out. blueprint for what I'm doing. Yeah. There's no blueprint. And you're a creative, so there are so yeah, many things Yeah, I just like to try it all out because, you know, as they say, I, I, you will be a long time dead. So do you think, do you feel at peace? I feel really excited that I can try my hand at different roles I did not know how Westminster worked I don't I'm not a career politician I've got no experience in the world of politics but actually that can almost give you more power because you ask the questions that everyone's asking as opposed to the questions or swerving them as as you've learned to do and and you can apply the skill set that you have as a musician which is like I suppose determination tenacity having to work continue to work through something and with a group those things are, are, are transferable skills. And, and in this case, it's, it's worked in the world of, of politics for me. We can learn so much from, from you and what you've achieved, I think. Oh, and, that's very kind of yeah. you to say. And I will <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know about that. I, I believe so. And I'm really proud to know you. And Thank you. I'm going to, you know, share the book in the show notes and where to get it and share all the information on you um, so that our listeners can can kind of do a bit more of a deep dive into what you do it's really kind of you thank you it's just so nice just sitting having a chat I just feel like I've just been chatting with good Bob. I want to create a bit more of a zen space so how you and I just normally chat how anyway chat. yeah exactly before we really finish off um as part of the podcast I'm introducing a little last um part to interact with the guests so I'm um just introducing something called pink Mondo truth or dare oh crikey let's go <laughs> so do you select truth or dare I, s- I select truth okay ah! Ah. okay <coughs> this is a funny one light-hearted okay all good <laughs> let's see shall we <laughs> what film or show what terrible film or show is your guilty pleasure oh oh I don't think it's terrible I'm, I I really enjoy succession but I just still can't get through it I just keep <laughs> the last 15 minutes of every episode I fall asleep I just can't get through it oh, so no. everyone everyone's talking about succession at the moment and oh my god did you see the fight and I'm like it's just gone I don't oh, know I, I still don't that. know um what's the other one I've been watching with um the girls uh, murder murders in the building I, I'm a very sensitive person. I cannot watch those kind of things. No, no, it's not scary. It's oh. funny. Oh, no, no, Murder right in the Building's then. funny. Oh, I can watch like scary movie. You know, like scary movie, but I can't watch. No, I, I cannot said, I can't watch, watch thrillers. Actual I can't watch scary them. movies. No, no, but you know the scary movie spoof film? I, I, I can't watch that. You can't watch that either? No. I don't want anything with children, anything with knives, anything with psychological thrillers. I can't watch them. I had to once interview Lars von Trier and I'm still, that was 10 years ago, I still have flashbacks <laughs> from the one movie of his that I managed to get through. No, I can't do it. I can't watch them either. He's, it's, it's a joke, a running joke within, within my friendship circle. When I'm like not available, they're like, okay, we're all going to meet up and we're going to watch a scary movie because no. you're not here. I'm like, okay, like, you I, go for it. I have friends <laughs> who watch scary movies as, yeah, like a, a sort of pastime for them. I just think they're bonkers. I can watch a documentary, though. Is yeah, that, I can watch a documentary. Yeah, like a murder documentary. Yeah, no, I can do that. I'm yeah. exactly the same as you. That's why we're buddies. 
but I, I, I'm terrified. Absolutely terrified. I don't want to watch anything with clowns. I don't no. want to watch anything with being chased. No, no, I nothing don't want that makes to me figure jump. out who did it. I don't want to know who did it. Yeah. I don't want to know I'm any of the you. details. This is why we're friends. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And but I appreciate this. <laughs> Sweets. You got me my favourite. Yeah, but the, the best ones aren't in there. No, I ate them all. We have to talk to them. I, I ate them all. These are the second best ones. I might add that into my show notes. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Petra. Class. Thank you.